Um, well, as um, Chris pointed out, I study the human brain, the functions and structure of the human brain. And I just want you to think for a minute about what this entails. Here is this mass of jelly, three pound mass of jelly, you can hold in the palm of your hand, and it can contemplate the vastness of interstellar space, it can contemplate the meaning of infinity, and it can contemplate itself contemplating on the meaning of infinity. And there is this peculiar recursive quality uh, that we call self-awareness, which I think is the holy grail of neuroscience, of neurology, and hopefully someday we'll understand how that happens. Okay, so how do you study this mysterious organ? I mean, you have 100 billion nerve cells, little wisps of protoplasm, interacting with each other, and from this activity emerges the whole spectrum of abilities that we call human nature and human consciousness. How does this happen? Well, there are many ways of approaching the functions of the human brain. One approach, the one we use mainly, is to look at patients who have sustained damage to a small region of the brain, or there's been a genetic change in a small region of the brain, what then happens is not an across-the-board reduction in all your mental capacity, it's a sort of blunting of your cognitive ability. What you get is a highly selective loss of one function with other functions being preserved intact. And this gives you some confidence in asserting that that part of the brain is somehow involved in mediating that function. So you can then map function onto structure and then find out what the circuitry is doing to generate that particular function. So that's what we're trying to do. So let me give you a few striking examples of this. In fact, I'm giving you three examples, six minutes each during this talk. The first example is an extraordinary syndrome called Capgras syndrome. If you look at the first slide there, uh, that's the temporal lobes, frontal lobes, parietal lobes, okay, the lobes that constitute the brain. And if you look tucked away inside the inner surface of the temporal lobes, you can't see it there, is a little structure called the fusiform gyrus. And that's been called the face area in the brain because when it's damaged, you can no longer recognize people's faces. You can still recognize them from their voice, say, oh yeah, that's Joe. But you can't look at their face and know who it is. Right? You can't even recognize yourself in the mirror. I mean, you know it is, it's you because when you wink, it winks and you know it's a mirror. But you don't really recognize yourself as, as yourself. Okay. Now that syndrome is well known, it's caused by damage to the fusiform gyrus, but there's another rare syndrome, so rare in fact, that very few physicians have heard about it, not even neurologists. This is called the Capgras delusion. And that is, a patient who's otherwise completely normal, who's had a head injury, comes out of coma, otherwise completely normal, he looks at his mother and says, this looks exactly like my mother, this woman, but she's an imposter. She's some other woman pretending to be my mother. Now, why does this happen? Why would somebody, and this person is perfectly lucid and intelligent in all of the respects, but when he sees his mother, this delusion kicks in and says, not mother. Now, the most common interpretation of this, which you find in older psychiatry textbooks, is a Freudian view. And that is that this chap, and the same argument applies to women, by the way, but I'll just talk about guys. When you're a little baby, when a young baby, you had a strong sexual attraction to your mother. This is the so-called Oedipus complex of Freud. I'm not saying I believe this, but this is the standard Freudian view. And then as you grow up, the cortex develops and inhibits these latent sexual urges towards your mother. Thank God, otherwise we'd all be sexually aroused when you saw your mother. And then what happens is there is a blow to your head, damaging the cortex, allowing these latent sexual urges to emerge flaming to the surface and suddenly and inexplicably you find yourself being sexually aroused by your mother. And you say, my God, if this is my mom, how come I'm being sexually turned on? She's some other woman, she's an imposter. It's the only interpretation that makes sense to your damaged brain. This never made much sense to me, this argument. It's very ingenious, as all Freudian arguments are. <laughs> Didn't make much sense, much sense because I have seen the same delusion, a patient having the same delusion, about his pet poodle. He'll say, doctor, this is not Fifi, it looks exactly like Fifi, but it's some other dog, right? Now you try using the Freudian explanation there. You have, you have to start talking about the latent bestiality in all humans or some such thing, which is quite absurd, of course. Now, what's really going on? 
So to explain this curious disorder, we look at the structure and functions of the normal visual pathways in the brain. Normally, visual signals come in into the eyeballs, go to the visual areas in the brain. There are, in fact, 30 areas in the back of your brain concerned with just vision. And after processing all that, the message goes to a small structure called the fusiform gyrus, um, where you perceive faces. There are neurons there that are sensitive to faces. You can call it the face area of the brain. Right? I talked about that earlier. Now, when that area is damaged, you lose the ability to see faces. Right? But from that area, the message cascades into a structure called the amygdala in the limbic system, the emotional core of the brain. And that structure called the amygdala gauges the emotional significance of what you're looking at. Is it prey? Is it predator? Is it mate? Uh, or is it something utterly trivial like a piece of lint or a piece of chalk or, a, or, a, or, a, or I don't want to point to that, but or, or a shoe or something like that, okay? Which you can completely ignore. So if the amygdala is excited, and this is something important, the messages then cascade into the autonomic nervous system. Your heart starts beating faster. You start sweating to dissipate the heat that you're going to exert, create from exerting muscular exertion. And that's fortunate because you can put two electrodes on your palm and measure the skin, change in skin resistance produced by sweating. So I can determine when you're looking at something whether you're excited or whether you're aroused or not. Okay, And I'll get to that in a minute. So my idea was when this chap looks at an object, uh, when he looks at his, any object for that matter, it goes to the visual areas, and however, and it's processed in the fusiform gyrus, and you recognize it as a pea plant, or a table, or your mother for that matter, okay? And then the message cascades into the amygdala, and then goes down the autonomic nervous system. But maybe in this chap, that wire that goes from the amygdala to the limbic system, the emotional core of the brain, is cut by the accident. So because the fusiform is intact, the chap can still recognize his mother and says, oh, yeah, this looks like my mother. But because the wire is cut to the emotional centers, he says, but how come if it's my mother, I don't experience a warmth or terror, as the case may be, <laughs> right? And therefore, he says, that, how do I account for this inexplicable lack of emotions? This can't be my mother. It's some strange woman pretending to be my mother. How do you test this? Well, what you do is you, if you take any one of you here and put you in front of a, a screen, and measure your galvanic scan response and show pictures on the screen. I can measure how you sweat when you see an object like a table or an umbrella. Of course, you don't sweat. If I show you a, a picture of a lion or a tiger or a pinup, you start sweating, right? And believe it or not, if I show you a picture of your mother, I'm talking about normal people, you start sweating. You don't even have to be Jewish. Yeah? <laughs> now, what happens, what happens if you show this patient you take the patient and show him pictures on the screen and measure his galvanic skin response. Tables and chairs and lint, nothing happens, as in normal people. But when you show him a picture of his mother, the galvanic skin response is flat. There's no emotional reaction to his mother. Because that wire going from the visual areas to the emotional centers is cut. So his vision is normal because the visual areas are normal. His emotions are normal. He'll laugh, he'll cry, so on and so forth. But the wire from vision to emotions is cut. And therefore, he has this delusion that his mother is an imposter. It's a lovely example of what the sort of thing we do. Take a bizarre, seemingly incomprehensible neuropsychiatric syndrome and say that the standard Freudian view is wrong, that in fact, you can come up with a precise explanation in terms of the known neuroanatomy of the brain. By the way, if this patient then goes and mother phones from an adjacent room, phones him, and he picks up the phone, he says, wow, mom, how are you? Where are you? There's no delusion through the phone. Then she approaches him after an hour. He says, who are you? You look just like my mother. Okay? The reason is there's a separate pathway going from the hearing centers in the brain to the emotional centers, and that's not being cut by the accident. So this explains why, with a phone, he recognizes his mother, no problem. When he sees it in person, he says it's, a delu he says it's an imposter. Okay. Now how is all this complex circuitry set up in the brain? Is it nature, genes, or is it nurture? And we approach this problem by considering another curious syndrome called phantom limb. And you all know what a phantom limb is when an arm is amputated or a leg is amputated for gangrene or you lose it in war, for example, in the Iraq war. It's now a serious problem. You continue to vividly feel the presence of that missing arm. And that's called a phantom arm or a phantom leg. In fact, you can get a phantom with almost any part of the body. Believe it or not, even with internal viscera. I've had patients with the uterus removed hysterectomy, who have a phantom uterus. 
including phantom menstrual cramps at the appropriate time of the month. And in fact, one student asked me the other day, do they get phantom PMS? <laughs> A subject ripe for scientific inquiry, but we haven't pursued that. Okay, now the next question is, what can you learn about phantom limbs by doing experiments? One of the things we found was about half the patients with phantom limbs claim that they can move the phantom. It'll pat his brother on the shoulder, It'll answer the phone when it rings. It'll wave goodbye. These are very compelling, vivid sensations. Patient's not delusional. He knows that the arm is not there. But nevertheless, it's a compelling sensory experience for the patient. But however, about half the patients, this doesn't happen. The phantom limb, they'll say, doctor, the phantom limb is paralyzed. It's fixed in a clenched spasm and is excruciatingly painful. If only I could move it, maybe the pain will be relieved. Now, why would a phantom limb be paralyzed? It sounds like an oxymoron. When we looked at the case sheets, what we found was these people with the paralyzed phantom limbs, the original arm was paralyzed because of a peripheral nerve injury. The actual nerve supplying the arm was severed, was cut by, say, a motorcycle accident. So the patient had an actual arm, which is painful, in a sling for a few months or a year. And then in a misguided attempt to get rid of the pain in the arm, the surgeon amputates the arm. And then you get a phantom arm with the same pains, right? And this is a serious clinical problem. Patients become depressed. Some of them are driven to suicide, OK? So how do you treat this syndrome? Now, why do you get a paralyzed phantom limb? When I looked at the case sheet, I found that they had an actual arm, and the nerve supplying the arm had been cut, and the actual arm had been paralyzed and lying in a sling for several months before the amputation. And this pain then gets carried over into the phantom it itself. Why does this happen? When the arm was intact but paralyzed, the brain sends commands to the arm, the front of the brain, saying, move. But it's getting visual feedback saying, no. Move, no, move, no, move, no. And this gets wired into the circuitry of the brain. And we call this learned paralysis. <laughs> 